You know, there really aren't that many good tone tutorials out there, in my opinion. I think part of the reason for that is just the subjectivity of music. It's difficult to try and help people get the tone that they want just because there are thousands of good tones out there. Different genres demand different tones. I mean, even the same genre can demand different tones. It's all up to the person. And so I'm going to try and give you the general tools to create your own tone for whatever music you're playing. So a lot of people that I've seen seem to think that they just need a piece of gear and all their problems will go away. And most of the time that's not true, I have found. So here you're looking at the seven steps that I created. He's just thinking on the topic, so I wanted a nice number. So they're a little general, uh, but that's for the sake of time and because I don't know what music you're playing, I don't know what kind of tone you're trying to get. So I'm just going to try and show you how I create tones myself, show you the general concepts, a uh, little philosophy of why I do some things, and hopefully it'll uh, take you somewhere. So I am going to assume pretty basic guitar knowledge, but I, I may say some things that you may not understand, in which case pause the video and consult the almighty mighty Google for any terms that you may not understand. So let's begin. Unsurprisingly, we begin with step one on this list, which is the player, the musician. So I hear this phrase frequently, you probably have too, which is the tone is in the hands. And what does that actually mean? Uh, in simplest terms, it means that if your technique is bad, your tone is going to be bad. It doesn't matter how many thousands of dollars you shell out for a guitar or an amp or some even a studio engineer. Like if you can't play, then your tone's not going to work. So in some ways, that's a good thing. You know, you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a good tone. You can do it with free plugins as long as you're a good player. On the other hand, it does mean that you need to be a good player. You know, so just improving your technique helps a lot. In fact, I would say it's guaranteed that if you play better, your tone will be better. So in many ways, that should be empowering. You know, is there something so readily available to you that you can just help out with? Now, I'm not saying that the rest of these steps don't matter because they do. But I am saying that if your playing isn't up to par, then the rest of these are not going to help you as much as you may want them to. So as a little side note on player, I want to talk about picks, which are criminally under-talked about. Uh, I've already said there's a ton of subjectivity and tone, and that applies to picks as well, so I can't give you a whole lot, but I can tell you that being comfortable is the single most important thing, like as a player. It'll get you the best possible performance. You know, if you're not like trying to scratch an itch or something, or you're desperately trying to hold your pick because your hand is sweating, like that's just not going to help anything. So some people prefer thin picks, some people prefer thick picks, uh, like the very popular Jazz 3s. I'm more of a thin guy myself. I use 0.88 millimeter for rhythm and one millimeter for cleans and leads. Uh, the reasoning behind the thinner rhythm picking is because I'm playing harder, so I want it to flex a little bit more. So I prefer Dunlop Ultex personally, just because the material does not seem to slip away from me no matter how much sweating is going on, which is really good for being comfortable. But next up, we have step two, which is guitar. I think this step is probably really overrated and yet underrated at the same time. And the first thing on the guitar is the strings, actually. And they get ignored probably a lot. Most people don't change their strings nearly as much as they should. And so new strings, they are, they're brighter, they're more articulate. I think they feel better to play on personally. And so just changing new strings makes your tones just sound better instantly. Like you don't even have to do anything. It's really nice. But they're also, strings are just like picks too, in the sense that thickness matters. It matters quite a bit. So you want to find a thickness that makes you the most comfortable because comfort is important. I'm going to keep reiterating that. You know, some people like really thick strings. Some people like really thin strings. I prefer thinner strings generally, but I also want to say that I like to make sure my tuning is stable. And so sometimes that requires thick strings, especially on detuned guitars. What I found with a lot of eight strings that I've seen is the, the lowest strings are almost always too thin and it just makes your tuning a nightmare on that string. Like it's just awful. So make sure that's good because let's talk about tuning right now. Tuning is probably the single most important thing when it comes to your guitar. You know, if you have a really cheap guitar but it's set up right and it's intonated properly and what I mean by intonation is that your tuning is consistent from fret to fret string to string so your chords will be in tune basically at any point so getting back to that if you have a cheap guitar that's intonated properly versus an expensive guitar that is not the cheap guitar is going to win every time because tuning sort of invalidates your entire tone if it's gotten wrong or done wrong rather because you could have like the best guitar player on planet earth playing through the best rig ever and if his guitar is out of tune like everyone is going to notice 
and everyone's going to think it sounds off. And there's a little leeway, obviously. It's mathematically impossible to intonate straight fret guitars like perfectly, but you can get really close and you can get closer than a lot of people already have. So this is not a guitar setup video because nobody wants to sit here for two hours and hear me talk about all the intricacies of some of these things. But I'll say, you know, adjusting your truss rod, adjusting your bridge angle, your bridge height on a per side basis is just really going to help you a lot, actually just being comfortable in general. And so pickups, the last thing to say, pickups are pretty much the same as everything else I've talked about. There's a billion different kind of pickups and a gazillion different ways you can configure your pickups in terms of angle or height. And so all I can really recommend is just trying out a bunch and figure out what you like. And I'm sorry, I know that's not what people want to hear, but there isn't much I can say because people are going to have different opinions about different pickups. Like I prefer passive pickups. I know a lot of people who like active pickups and they get great tones with active pickups. So I can't really say anything against them at the same time you know i'm just some guy right and i mean that in like just the straightest way possible i'm just some guy right now so all i'm saying i'm gonna try and give you reasonings for what i'm doing but you should ultimately try yourself and decide if what i have to say is worth listening to otherwise you're just wasting your time here right so try it out and get it going. And then I think I said pickups were the last thing, but I, I lied because I have to talk about the guitar itself, which actually doesn't matter a whole lot. Uh, that's the truth. A guitar is probably one of the lowest things on the list for getting your tone properly set up. I think comfort is really the only thing that matters, honestly, with the guitar. You know, if, if it weighs a good amount, if it's the right shape for you, that's a whole lot more important than whatever it's made out of or how many thousands of dollars are put into its construction. So moving on to step three, we have the amp, which also covers pedals, preamps, and anything that's directly affecting the tone from guitar to amp. There's also a little hidden step from two to three, which is the cable. I don't think many people are thinking about, uh, you know, how that little cable is transmitting your entire tone that you've worked so hard on from to this point, and it's transmitting it to the amp for you. So make sure you're not using 99 cent cables. You should be good to go. Like, you don't need to spend $100 on solid gold cables made by Chinese hands, no older than six. But you do, you know, definitely make sure your cables aren't short circuiting or picking up interference. And you should be good to go from there. So, as far back to the amps, basically, I think most people are looking towards this step to get a good tone. And it is important. You know, don't misunderstand me. But I'm going to keep reiterating that the previous steps are so important to get right first because if you don't have steps one and two done here then your amp choice isn't going to help anything you know you're trying to save a sinking ship with a bucket it's just not going to work so if i actually got into specifics on amp models and types i mean this video would be so many hours long it'd be ridiculous but i can continue my theme of general advice so generally you start with an amp i know Somebody just face foamed to that, but really though, if you don't know which amp to start with, I'd recommend looking up a band whose tone you'd like and, you know, pick something similar or exactly the same because source tones are immeasurably important. That's something I didn't understand when I started out is that if your mentality is to fix it in the mix later, whether in a live mix or on a record, then you are doomed to failure. I'm going to repeat that. You are doomed to failure. The goal should be to do as little as possible to fix your tone in a mix. So some amp sims will sound bad to you. Some amps will sound bad to you. And this applies to preamps, guitars, pickups, pedals, songs, bands, life advice, and so many other things is that some people will like one thing and you may try it and you will not like it. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, you can try and force it and be unhappy and uncomfortable, or you can find something better. And then I do understand that sometimes you don't have a choice. You know, due to budget, you may only have one amp that's not all that great, in which case just make the best of what you have. But otherwise, find your best starting point. So I just played that brief clip so you can kind of hear one of the tones I was working with. I played in isolation too, which really reveals a lot of things about the mix when you hear a guitar tone with everything else around it versus by itself. It's interesting, so I'll solo this now. <laughs> Now 
they always sound thinner in isolation like this because the bass needs some room to live. That's the fully finished process tone, but even if I unmute this, you'll see it doesn't change a whole lot. Here's the raw tone, directly recorded. <laughs> So you'll notice even with zero processing on this tone, it still sounds really good straight at the source because as I said, source tones are important. This was a 5153 patch directly from my Kemper. So I've tried a lot of 5153 patches and I didn't like some of them, but this one sounded the best by itself. So I went with that one, but I'm gonna show you that, you know, you don't need a ton of fancy gear to do something. I'm gonna show you how I would create something like this by itself. And so to do that, I'm gonna come over here to the guitar DIs. So this is just the direct recording straight from the guitar, no processing applied to this. Play that real quick. So the thing to keep in mind with this is that this is fulfilling steps one and two right here because I spent a long time tracking this entire EP, which is what these parts are taken from. So I made sure that my guitar was set up and make sure it was in tune, made sure the performances were directly how I wanted them. So I know these performances are good, which means that we are set up to get a good tone. So as I use the 513 in this other patch, I'm gonna just open a sim real quick, uh, probably TSEX50, which is the same. There's a free version of this too that you can use. This one is, I think it's like 60 or $80. This one, really not expensive at all. You can do something similar with free tones. I'm just more familiar with this one. So when setting up an amp for the first time, I would generally just start with everything set at noon like this except for gain, which I would put really far down. And so now from here, what I'd recommend doing is just playing your tone like this, either playing pre-recorded or playing like live, play something through this and just adjust from here one thing at a time. And the first thing I'd recommend adjusting is gain. Now, I don't know what you're playing. I don't know what genre you're playing, what amp you have or have access to. I don't know what kind of tone you want. So I can't tell you exactly what to set your gain to, but if it's a lower gain sound, then just put it until you're happy, like ear wise. And then if it's a high Higher gain sound, what I recommend doing is just keep pushing the gain up until the point where it sounds a little too fizzy and then back off because there's two problems with too much gain. The first is that it makes your tone fizzy in the high end and you can't EQ it out and it's really annoying. And the second thing it does is that it takes away from your performance because distortion is compression, which is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but it's important to understand that the more gain you add, the more you are removing the dynamics of the performance, which is fine to an extent, but then at some point you are just losing all your technique. It's just becoming white noise at that point so i'm going to play this and i'm going to just start adjusting the gain knob until i'm happy and i'll solo this only track this uh, left track only <laughs> I think it sounds good at about four. You don't need nearly as much as you think most of the time. And then as far as the low end goes, the low end's a little unruly. And so what I would recommend doing is adding either an EQ or a tube screamer before the amp. And what these tube screamers do is they would actually roll off low end before it's even hitting the amp, which really tightens up the sound. And I will show that to you by engaging this on and off. it really cleans up the sound quite a bit. So I boosted the volume a bit just because the level of this recording is kind of low. I turned down the tone because the high end already sounds pretty good to me, overly distorted. And then I just bumped up the drive a tad just because I kind of like the saturation these things provide for the tone. But really though, it's not, not doing a whole lot settings wise on this. Back to the guitar though. I'm gonna sort of adjust these things as I'm going. And you can already hear that it sounds pretty good i haven't even done anything that's sort of the point i've been getting at is that if your guitar set up and your performance is good you really don't need to actually do anything to get a good tone out of it so i'm gonna go listen to the low end i'm gonna adjust it i'm gonna listen to the mid-range i'm gonna listen to the treble and we'll go on from there I'll just observe the process in action <laughs> And 
I guess I should talk about that before I do it. So just by listening to that, it sounds like there's it needs a little more low end. The mid range, I think there's a little bit too much. And I'm not sure about the treble. I'll have to I'll decide when I fix these two. So those sound better to me like that. I'm also going to adjust these two knobs over here since I have access to them, so I'll do that real quick. So I also just boosted the input because like I said, these were recorded very quiet. That already sounds pretty good. I haven't even changed the cabinets or done anything here, which I'm not going to. So I'm gonna turn that off. So this is already sounding good to me. I would work with this in context of the mix, like on solo this and start tweaking a few things because I have access to that. So when it comes to the differences between cleans, rhythms, and leads, there's not too much different. For a clean, it's pretty much the exact same process you see here, just changing the EQs a little bit and obviously turning the gain down, just selecting a different channel. With leads, it's pretty much the exact same thing as rhythm. The only difference is I was add a little bit more bass, a little less treble because you're playing higher notes typically. So you'll need more bass and you'll need less treble. And you'll also usually have a little more gain on the leads just for sustain. You know, if you're trying to sustain a long bend or a pinch harmonic, having a lot more gain helps quite a bit with that. Otherwise though, it's the exact same process here. So as far as a couple other things, I said I would talk about preamps, but they really are just so unnecessary. Not to say that they don't make a difference, but most of the time you won't even have one. And even if you do, you can just listen to it yourself and determine if it's doing anything. As far as pedals, you can put them here. You know, if you want a phaser effect, sure, put it here. This one doesn't have a whole lot. You can put any sort of effects here, chorus, phaser, vibrato, wah. It doesn't affect anything in the end because you'll be doing this exact same process where you just listen and determine, you know, what does this tone need? Does it need more low and mid-range treble? And then decide from there. So with regards to pedal order, it's not super strict. I would probably do something like this with a gate, then compressor, then distortion, then like the more phasey effects like chorus, flanger, phaser, stuff like that. These aren't strictly in stone either. You can all swap all these around. You can have multiples. I know a lot of metal guys like to put gates into screamers into another gate after that. The things that I would pay most attention to is the delay and reverb though. I'd recommend putting the delay before the reverb and have the reverb at the end of the chain because the reverb is creating the space for the entire tone. You want the room to exist after everything exists in the room basically otherwise you get stuff outside of space and it just sounds a little weird but that's enough of that now we move on to step four which is cabinets now cabinets make a big difference in terms of post amp eq in fact i would say they probably affect the sound more than the amp itself or at least adjusting these eqs and it's really it's a philosophical decision if you want to adjust the cabinets before the amp or before adjusting the amp i should say so if you have the option then try out a bunch of cabinets if you don't well then obviously this does not apply but i'm going to disable the cabinets on tse and open probably amplitude just because they have better visuals so i can demonstrate what i'm going to talk about here so if you you have the option of multiple speakers, I should say, and then you're gonna have to find which speaker is the best speaker. Let me uh, find a rectifier 4x12, like that. That'll be good enough for this. So each of these speakers is going to sound different, even if they have the exact same speaker model in here, which I'm gonna select the V30s because they are extremely popular and you probably have one if you have a physical cabinet. So you're gonna need to find which one of these is the best. On a sim like this, you can just move the mic around, obviously, and pick which one you wanna go to. But with physical ones, you're gonna want ear protection for one because you wanna be doing this for a while and you're just gonna put your ear up to the cabinet directly like this while playing. Put it up to this one, listen to it, listen to this one, this one, this one. Decide which one sounds the best. If you can't tell, then you'll just pick one. It doesn't matter. But if you can tell, then, you know, put it there, use it. As far as 
how speaker miking works. It's a lot easier in a sim like this, obviously, but the general principles are that the closer you are to the center, the more high end you get. And as you drag it away, you lose high end. The same applies for moving it away. As you move it away, you lose high end, but you will pick up the room sound, which may or may not be desirable depending on your setup and what kind of tone you're going for. So I'm gonna demonstrate the point by just moving the microphone around while this is playing. This is a prog metal track, so I want it pretty defined, so I have it pretty close to the center. And as far as miking options, I mean, there's too many mics to talk about, but I will say that the SM57 is a very popular mic, and it's a very affordable mic as well. It's less than $200 easily, no matter where you get it, and many, many great tones have been made with it, just like this Kemper patch. So I'm also going to take the uh, secondary mic off here, because I'm not really big on double miking stuff. Not to say that it has no applications, because it does, but it's sort of overcomplicating this uh, at the moment. So I'm going to listen to how it sounds with just the 57. <laughs> So that sounds pretty good, to be fair. So I'll say cabinets affect amp sims a lot, which I'll make a separate video about amp sims somewhere in the future. But so if you have good cabinet impulses, you can take a really bad sim tone and turn it into a pretty good sim tone just with a single cabinet impulse. You can also ruin a good tone with a bad impulse. So be mindful of that. Now we get into step five, which is post-processing, which you might have thought all the magic happens here, but like I said, I haven't done any post-processing on this tone, and here's where we're at if I copy this over. <laughs> I would definitely work with that a little more, and especially in context of the mix, but you can see here I spent a grand total of maybe 30 seconds playing with the tone when I wasn't explaining, and it's already got to this point, so you can see how this is working out. I will mention before we get into post-processing, there was just the idea of double tracking, which isn't something you do live, but it's something you'll do in a studio. So you see I have two tracks. They're two separate performances that were recorded, and you pan one of them left and one of them right. You cannot copy because the phase will be the same, which the explanations why are a little beyond the scope of this video but suffice to say if you'll take my word that when you record two separate performances the differences will make it sound much wider in fact i can demonstrate by engaging mono which is what it'll sound like if you copied them <laughs> you can see it just sort of gets much wider if we have two tracks like this. As far as post-processing goes, there's not a whole lot to say. It's really just listening to the problems. So you don't need a fancy EQ either. You can use whatever default your DAW has. I just like the visuals of this one. So I'm gonna listen to this tone and decide what it kind of needs. <laughs> I think it has a little too much low end, so I'm going to add a high pass here like this. They're called high passes in most EQs just because it allows the high frequencies to pass over. And so in this case, you just cut out the low end. So what I'm going to do is just roll this up and I'm going to also add the bass in and then I'm going to decide if the bass has enough space by itself. <laughs> So I think it does have enough space now. Doing this pretty quick, but you can see the idea. I'm also going to do it up here. I'll say a lot of amp sims, this is the problem with a lot of amp sims, is that they have too much high end, which is sort of that digital sound as tape has a natural roll off up here. So I'm going to also drag this down until I'm happy with that. <laughs> You 
See, all I did was filter the low and high end, and it sounds much cleaner now. It'll sound just different by itself, but with everything else, it just sounds better. So now I'm gonna play this with the full mix, and we'll see what else it needs. see it. I just added a little mid-range here, a little high end, because I thought it sounded dull, and then scooped out some of this. And you might not be noticing them at all, because they're not making a big change, because our source tone is already so good. That's sort of what I keep getting at over and over, is that this stage is not supposed to be doing a whole lot. It's really not. It should already be sounding good from the microphone directly, and not from whatever you're doing in here. So the same thing applies everywhere. Like, here's a solo tone that I'll play for you real quick. already sounds really nice and all I'm doing is this I'm just filtering like I did earlier and scooping out some things that annoyed me and some harshness up here even without this I'll bypass this and you'll see it's not doing a whole lot See that yet again even without post-processing it sounds good by itself and that's what i keep getting at so let me find a clean tone example here one of these let me disable all the processing on these cleans and you can hear what they sound like just directly That's with nothing on them, and even if you add something on them. All I'm adding there is just high end and compression. It's just not, I'm not radically altering the state of anything. I'm just making sure that it's good when I hear it in my room, and then it sounds good in the recording as well. So with that, we move on to step six, which is bass tone. How does bass tone affect your guitar tone? It might sound a little odd if you're newer to this, but the bass is working to fill out the low end of your guitar, and they work together a lot in many genres, especially ones like this, where your guitar is providing the definition for a riff and your bass is providing most of the power. So this isn't a bass tone video. We're already running pretty long here, but I'm going to demonstrate what it does for your tone by muting and unmuting the bass. And I will go back to the original tone, because the bass tone was specifically crafted for this one. It stutters a little bit because I'm recording this, but you can hear that every time I muted the bass, the entire mix just got much thinner and the guitar tone got a lot weaker sounding. That's important to keep in mind if you're unhappy with your tone. It may be that your bass tone needs to either be there or it needs to be better. So we can skip right through to step seven as well, which is drums and the rest of the mix. This is something that I think I struggled with a lot when I started, was that my guitar tone was, it was okay. They weren't good by any means, but they were okay. But they sounded a lot worse just because the rest of my mix sounded terrible, and the drums especially. Harsh cymbals will swallow your frequency space and make your tone sound much worse than it actually is. Harsh vocals do the exact same thing. If you're up to this point, your tone still isn't working, then maybe the rest of your mix is a problem. Another thing to talk about at this point is arrangement. So if you have strings, piano, a lead, and a rhythm guitar all playing in the same octave, you're going to get 
just a muddy mess and I keep saying this is not an X video and it's not an arrangement video either but I have to keep mentioning this because it's all connected. The best possible tones come from a good arrangement played by a good player through good gear. So if you make sure each step on the list is okay before you go to the next one then you really shouldn't have any problems with tone even if you're using a $5,000 amp and guitar or just a free sim and cheap gear as long as it's intonated properly. You can see the tone that we already got I just created here within a minute. I spent almost no time at all. So most of the time spent on this tone was just explaining what I was doing and going slowly so that you could see what was going on. But I spent less than two minutes creating this. I only tried one cabinet too. If I tried more cabinets, this would sound even better because I would eventually find one that worked out better in the mix. This guitar, this is a $400 guitar that I set up myself. It's not an expensive guitar by any means. This sim, this sim is 80 bucks. It's not expensive at all. And you can do something similar with a free sim if you work with it a little more. I don't think I have one right now, so I can't demonstrate that. But you can take a free sim and get a pretty similar tone to this, to be honest. There's a lot of good ones out there, as long as your performance and guitar are good. So if you'd like to see more videos like this, then like the video and subscribe to the channel to get updates for future content. Thank you for watching.